CD was released in around 84, I guess, um, I saw an opportunity to make a passive preamplifier. Um, so I started making the line drive series of passive preamps. And uh, that was also a very interesting learning experience uh, because it seems like such a almost trivially simple thing, um, you know, to put connectors and wire and a volume control on a box and hey, you know, that's all you need, what could go wrong? Um, but it turns out to be a much more subtle kind of problem if you want to achieve really high level performance, all of the, uh, all of the bits and pieces, all the aspects of which, which jacks and which wire and how it's grounded and what volume control and a um, lot of subtlety in that to, you know, to get a really high performance uh, passive unit. So Are that putting a buffer stage in that early line drive. No, no, that later on, I, I created the TLC one in the late eighties, right. Uh, transparent line control number one. And that was uh, the evolution where I put a high performance JFET uh, based buffer in it. So it was a passive, it had a passive signal path and a buffered output. Uh, so it, basically. Yeah, so you had to plug it in. Um, you could use the passive output if you wanted to, um, but you know what I'd learned from doing the purely passive thing is that people there are circumstances where a purely passive unit wouldn't really match up well right. um, because of you know cable capacitance or amplifier low amplifier input impedance or a variety of issues. And by adding the buffer stage to that, that that got around those those sticking points. Um, and meant that it could be used um, with any mix of equipment so long as you didn't actually need added gain from the preamplifier. And that, that turned out to be true most of the time, like 97 or 98% of the time. Um, but then there's a funny bit of psychology that goes along with that because uh, a lot of people were reluctant to turn the volume control up. Uh, because they were so accustomed to having too much volume by the time they got like a quarter or a third of the way up. Uh, here suddenly there's something where, you know, you might have to turn it all the way up to get the system to be as loud as you want it to. Again, rare, but did happen. But what we found is a lot of people just simply had this psychological block against going like past halfway <laughs> on the volume control. That's right. So, you know, had to overcome that. Uh, that sort of stuff occasionally to uh, to get people to know that it was okay. You could do that, and uh, nothing was going to blow up. Well, I think yeah. for some of the viewers that may be a little bit newer to the, being an audiophile or less technically inclined, it's important to just highlight what Steve was saying about passive preamps. There's a lot to like about them, but I've seen personally in my I had the TLC one at one time. Uh, which did have the buffer stage, but I've seen people buy passive preamps and have less than desirable results because as he said, high capacitance cables, depending on what you're using or the length of the run was often the problem to your amp and then a, a poor input impedance for the amp relative to that type of situation can cause a lot of problems. So it's important to, you know, be cognizant of those issues and understand them. And again, working with Steve over the years, this is what I've learned, but something that if you're thinking of a passive preamp, make sure you consider all those variables. Yeah, it's useful to understand the pros and cons. Now, I will also say that there are now quite a number of uh, TVCs or transformer-based volume controls, some with autoformers, some with transformers. Um, and those do get around a lot of the, the issues of like impedance matching and cable capacitance and that sort of thing. They have some other issues of their own, uh, but not those exact <laughs> problems. Um, anyway, uh, for quite a few people, a passive um, control center preamplifier was a very good solution, um, especially if they, you listen more to classical music and like small chamber orchestra, string ensemble, that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but for people who wanted more of a, a very dynamically lively sound, powerful bass, you know, really extended open top, et cetera, 
um, active preamplifiers were generally um, preferable uh, for one reason or another. And so, of course, that led me down that path. Um, but I learned an awful lot from the passive preamplifiers when they really were working well and everything matched up. Uh, in terms of transparency and neutrality, freedom from coloration, freedom from noise, freedom from distortion, um, they were remarkably good and really kind of embarrassed a lot of the active preamplifiers of the day uh, in that regard. But then, you know, then you try to figure out, okay, well, how can I get the best of both worlds? And uh, that led to a very, very long uh, developmental story for the uh, preamplifier that I call the VRE1 <clears throat> and uh, what it has ultimately come to be. Uh, uh, but that that was a, a long developmental project and it really ultimately like the most difficult thing I ever did to, uh, you know, to get the performance levels that I wanted out of that to hit all the goals that I had. I thought for a while I just wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but then I I discovered a few things um, that were that were keys to the ultimate solution. Um, one of those was a choke filtered power supply without using regulation, um, and the other was figuring out ultimately how to use transformer coupling um, for both the input and the output um, uh, to uh, give me, you know, the overall results I was looking for. Um, but that. You know, that preamplifier to me uh, still is the closest thing to hearing what's really in the recording. I mean, if you want to really know what went on in that recording at that moment in time, um, then I, I find that gets me closer, you know, to feeling like I'm right there with the musicians or, you know, the music's in the room, however you want to look at that, that, that sensation of having all the barriers all of the distortions, all of the veils are gone, and you know you're hearing the exactly what went down. I think it's uh, important part to uh, remember because a lot of audiophiles nowadays are dismissing the need for a preamp, or it's built into their DAC or their surround sound processor, and so it's mainly thought of now as a convenience for input switching, and thinking that they're all the same, uh, but maybe and maybe to a large extent it's true because a lot of people haven't put the level of attention that you have into a preamp and so yeah. a lot of them do sound pretty much all the same uh, obviously a tubes can add something to it but um and people do use preamps sometimes as tone controls versus a window on the performance like your philosophy so there are people that may choose something different than what your goal design is but sure um, i think it's important to note that your preamp pursuit is something that people don't really realize they always think of you as the amp guy and the, the, you know the dnas and the, the mods but yeah it's your first priority when you were kind of in the last decade or so has been dedicated to designing this ultimate preamp and so people yeah I, that was a a very long-term um effort that got pretty deep um and uh, ultimately, I was very happy with how it how it turned out. But that was a sort of a cost no object uh, statement piece um, that that was selling for right around twenty thousand dollars originally. Or well, I'm sorry, not originally, but the the VRE went C by the time I got to that point where it was fully remote controlled and had all those you know features. Um, and then um, uh, working with um, uh, I collaborate with um, uh, Rick Brown of Hi-Fi One out here. He, he's got his uh, business out here. And he's um, uh, somebody who's really looking for ultimate playback systems and working with the clients, you know, that are interested in that sort of thing. Um, and so I developed a version of the preamplifier for him that was like between fifty and sixty thousand dollars more in that range, depending on certain options. Uh, with an all-new power supply system, totally revamped, rebuilt, um, and uh, cabling, and you know the use of silver wire transformers and silver wire chokes, and 
Doolin cast silver capacitors and um, the one that also has a Panzerholtz uh, chassis. Well, that's where we are now. That's only that's relatively recently that okay. I moved moved beyond the the Corian of the original chassis to the Panzerholtz um, version, which is what I'm doing now. Yeah, that's another material that is getting a little more attention now because of its anti-resonant properties. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time on resonance control, especially right. the value in speakers and for isolating your turntables. 